Amanda, ciérrale, ciérrale. Make we cut a long story short. Tell you about a youth who was too smart. Him trot anywhere after dark. Tell me, he named Mr. Braveheart. He never heard this ya one before. Life and no something where you buy in a store. Youth was so brave, yes, he was so bold. Him say, hot blood never run cold. Anything you want, Braveheart, bring it come. Three feet chopped down, Braveheart, chop it up. Babylon a come.
Board of Supervisors is now in session March 15th, 2011 at 1125 a.m. Uh, to the clerk for roll call, please. Supervisor Brown. Here. Supervisor McCowan. Here. <coughs> Supervisor Pinches. Here. Supervisor Hamburg. Here. Chair Smith. Here. And we will ask uh, Ruth Valenzuela to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So we will begin our meeting today with a moment of silence for the victims of the earthquake and uh, the tsunami. Thank you very much. In particular, I wanted to mention that um, our hearts go out to Fort Bragg's sister city, the city of Otsuchi, where 10,000 are missing and out of a population of 15,000. The mayor and the majority of the local assembly were working on earthquake response and are presumed dead. And our thoughts are with them as well as all uh, the Japanese citizens. Thank you. Supervisor Madam Chair, I just, uh, just want to mention the town of Miyasa, uh, which is the sister city of uh, the town of Mendocino. And Miasa is located in the what's called the Northern Alps, so it's um, pretty much due west and a bit north of Sendai and the areas that are being the most affected. But as we know, Japan's a small island, and uh, everybody on Japan is feeling the effects. And perhaps countries um, uh, that are other than Japan are going to feel some effects. So. Um, my heart certainly goes out to the sister city of Fort Bragg and uh, wishing the, uh, uh, the people of my Miasa the best as well. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, we will now go to public expression. This <coughs> is uh, the time that the board invites members of the audience to comment on interests that are not on the agenda. So we'll go first to Mr. J.R. Rose. Madam Chair, member of the board, staff, my name is J.R. Rose. I think you both, most of you know me. First of all, I'd like to talk about something I know you're not going to be able to attend, but uh, the Area Board of Aging is uh, on uh, elder abuse, is going to have a seminar on the 17th of May at the uh, Civic Center there on uh, 200th uh, South State Street there where the uh, Ukiah Greater Chamber of Commerce is. People that are out there, the meeting's going to be between 8 o'clock and 3 p.m. And we, our guests will be either uh, 
our own district attorney, David Eisner, or one of his staff, and also uh, the district attorney from uh, Fort Bragg, or one of his staff, will talk to the elders about uh, financial abuse and how to avoid it. That's one thing I like to talk about in this situation. And like you, my heart goes out to the people in Japan. I was sitting in my home Thursday night. I watched the whole thing an hour and a half on a public uh, helicopter deal with tuning. I didn't get bits and pieces. I got a whole, whole hour and a half, and I tell you, it was tremendous. But as you know, I'm also a senior person, so I'm going to talk about seniors and the price. As everything is going is the price of gas and everything else is going up along with the price of gas, so does the food, everything that has to be done. And as I've been talking to this board for the last seven years and I'm going, and I'm maybe whipping an old dead horse to death, but I'm still not going to back out of it. I'm still looking for rent stabilization for mobile home parks here in the county. I'm slowly getting some support. I'm not going to mention who they are, but some, sooner or later we need to get this put on the agenda. And whether you vote for it or not against it, I still think it needs to be addressed, and I would appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate your time, and uh, thank you again very much. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Any other uh, comments under public expression? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to agenda item number three, the approval of minutes. The board has three sets uh, of minutes, February 15th, February 16th, and March 1st. To the I'm board. I move approval as submitted. Second. Thank you, supervisors. We have a motion for uh, approval of all three sets of minutes. Supervisor McCowan with a second of, by Supervisor Brown. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Hearing none, uh, the motion for approval passes unanimously. Uh, we now will go to We will now go to an off agenda item uh, sponsored by the chair. This will, uh, the motion would be to establish that urgent board consideration of this matter is necessary due to timeline. Uh, and, it, and the clerk or the, uh, the chair would uh, go to counsel, county council for findings and then to my colleagues to invite a motion and action. You can make it, given the nature of the circumstances, you can make the find, appropriate findings for this. Okay, so. Item. So this would be a two-step process. First is the off-agenda consideration that was just uh, uh, stated that uh, there's concurrence from council. Then we would go to the actual um, the actual item that the chair would introduce. So to to I the board, that, I move that we uh, make the appropriate findings to add the adoption of the resolution declaring a local emergency to our agenda. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor. Is there a second? No second. Okay, we have a motion by Supervisor McCowan and a second by Supervisor Hamburg. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Motion passes unanimously. So the item before us is adoption of a resolution declaring a local emergency related to the March 11th, 2011 tsunami event. Uh, the board has uh, uh, before us a very brief one-page summary. Attached is a resolution that delineates specifics regarding the event and the effects that the, um, the uh, local event uh, has uh, the impacts that, that the Mendocino Coast has experienced because of the tsunami events. Um, I believe we might have some of those in the audience that would wish to speak to this. So let's, um, let's go to comment on it and then we'll, I would uh, look to my colleagues for, um, for a specific motion. I wanted to go over a few details. I was in the harbor both Saturday and Sunday and but I'll wait until we've, we've heard from um, our partners who would like to comment. We'll go to Sheriff Almond. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I think that everything that um, needs to be said has been in the paper, and, and this body surely would know that um, the tsunami passed with the um, with use, utilizing the training that uh, every agency has been through, whether it's Fort Bragg Police Department, Fort Bragg Fire, Caltrans, CHP, Coast Guard and the sheriff's office, we've all worked uh, together with the notification, the reverse 911. And this is, this is new technology that, you know, ultimately, unfortunately, is going to be put into our budget as a on-current event. But I, I don't want 
to downplay the necessity of reverse 911 because it was very instrumental in getting the word out to everyone. But uh, we, we escaped without any injury in this county, without any damage other than Anoyo Harbor. No county roads were, were damaged and the, the communication during the event through the radio system and cellular telephone system worked without any hitch. So um, kudos to our team players on this one because it worked out real well. On March 23rd is a tsunami training day that's been planned for six months and that training day is going to be used to reevaluate everything that happened last Friday to see if we can fine tune our, our ability. So uh, it was good that our state and federal elected leaders did come down to the harbor this weekend and, and meet with several of us to see firsthand what the damage is. Any questions regarding the response or are any of your constituents concerned about any of the action that was taken on the response day? I just have a question. What, what, what's the estimated, uh, or is it too early to tell what the estimated damages at the harbor are? Uh, that's a tough one um, because I've heard anywhere from uh, half a million to four million. So I think that until they get divers down there to, number one, remove the debris. The removal of the debris is, is critical. Uh, with there are some boats that may not be able to go in and out of the harbor right now until some of the pilon pilings that have fallen are removed. So what the uh, harbor master has told me that their first priority is to get a dive team down there to do an inspection, remove the de debris, and then do a full inspection of their infrastructure to see what needs to be replaced. But one of the things that we're seeing is because the, uh, the do boat docks themselves are close to 60 years old, uh, the materials that they were used to build with, such as creosote pilings, cannot legally be allowed to be used again. And so they're going to be looking at upgrading their uh, infrastructure with cement or other other structure piling. So the, as the harbor master told me, he says you can't just replace the end of the boat docks without replacing the whole thing because of the, uh, the damage that's gone all the way through from the end of the boat docks to the shore. So it's, it's a big one. Sheriff, the only comments I've had beginning on Friday and then that carried through the weekend were uh, just very positive ones about the, the unified um, response effort. Very timely, very effective. Because everyone was so engaged, uh, it just, uh, with road closures and really alerting the public, uh, specifically the 911, reverse 911, and then the Im immediate response of both Department of Transportation and your staff really made it rather a seamless uh, response. And obviously things could have been a lot worse than they were, but everyone was prepared and ready. So that, that's the only feedback I got. I'm not downplaying the disaster, but it was very nice to have a day where I did not deal with marijuana, COVLO, or the budget. <laughs> agreed, agreed. <laughs> Supervisor Brown. Thank you, Chair Smith. Um, and I think the practices that we've had um, in past years had a lot to do with um, everybody being prepared. And I don't know as though Oregon does the same thing as we have done up and down the coast. Um, and it was certainly <coughs> too bad that the one young man um, didn't understand what a tsunami is and, and how that's created. Because I know as soon as I heard about the earthquake, I started doing prayers for our coast and especially uh, Crescent City because Crescent City always seems to be the one hardest hit. Um, but anyway, um, it's just too bad somebody clear across the ocean lost their life because they didn't understand. So public awareness, I think, really played yeah. into all of it. And another comment moving now on to the adoption uh, of the <laughs> resolution is we had excellent response from our elected officials, Congressman Mike Thompson, uh, Senator Evans, and Assemblymember Chesbro were on board immediately with contact, with, with offers to help, with concern, and I think that's really going to do quite a bit. Uh, in terms of uh, advancing this local emergency status and it would be going to the governor with uh, the passage of our resolution here today and I know that those documents are already in the works and they're, they are ready to go forward as soon as we uh, hopefully unanimously pass this. The Harbor District has of, of course experienced quite a bit of challenge from the moment of the event occurring but they got right back to, um, I asked that they get items to staff to prepare this 
by yesterday p.m. and they did just that and did as much of a comprehensive review as time would allow. Um, as the sheriff said, they're going to need to do um, diving expeditions to figure out the extent of the damage. So there's a lot more work that, of course, we'll have to to come into play. But we um, we're trying to work and have a really united effort on the. Um, repairs to the harbor. The concern that was voiced over the weekend was that these docks in particular are vital to um, visiting fishing vessels and everyone is poised to uh, receive hopefully the um, the declaration of a salmon season of some sort this year. Um, all uh, information points to that there will be one and if these repairs do not happen expeditiously, it could jeopardize the ability of Noyo Harbor to be um, uh, able to uh, capture some of that, uh, uh, the economics of, of uh, visiting fishing vessels and actually harboring and supporting the existing fishing vessels. So um, that really is the challenge before us. It's an economic, um, one of, of economic necessity, and that's, that's clearly on, in the forefront of everyone's mind, including our elected officials who are very aware of this challenge to Nyo Harbor. Not at all the magnitude of what happened, um, as Supervisor Brown alluded to, in Crescent City, but nonetheless very devastating to our small local harbor. Um, so you have, I think, a very good uh, resolution that was created by the executive office uh, getting all of the pertinent points forward for the declaration so our elected officials can give us the maximum amount of support going forward. Supervisor Pinches. I don't want to, don't intend to pick apart this resolution, but the first whereas probably should say a magnitude 9.0. It's actually been adjusted to a 9.0. And you go down to the, uh, the second from the bottom, whereas should say has the capacity. Which item was that, Supervisor? The, the, the second to the bottom, whereas oh. it should be the, has the capacity, not has capacity, probably. But the one that I really is the uh, the last whereas the Board of Supervisors now complains an emergency <coughs> does exist throughout Mendocino County. Is does that kind of take the focus? I mean, if somebody read that, they say, well, where's the problems in Mendocino? Shouldn't we focus on the coast? Well, I think it's good to be somewhat generic on this. There were responses that needed to occur, and they actually mm -hmm. did traverse various aspects of the county, not just the coast. So I don't know. I would go to council on that one to see about the appropriateness of that language. I would rec recommend leaving it okay, the way it is. Okay. So, Supervisor Pinches, did you want to propose any actual changes to the other items you mentioned? No, I just, to me, it kind of takes the emphasis out when you put it, when you say that it's emergency throughout Mendocino County, because it's clearly, you know, I just think it takes the emphasis off, off of where the problem was. But if the coastal supervisors disagree, that's fine. Well, I think council is advising that we keep it generalized, so I, I think it's fine. Supervisor Brown. Um, Thank you, Chair Smith, and thank you also for talking about um, what um, is looking like a fishing season for salmon coming up and the concerns um, about being able to um, host um, out of area vessels, et cetera, at, at Noyo Harbor. I would very much like to know, will this go online, this off agenda item? Because I would like to email it. Um, I'm sure that to, that <clears throat> that can be that can that can occur if it has not occurred. That's okay. a good point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Supervisor McCallum. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll move adoption of the resolution before us, making the two minor corrections suggested by Supervisor Pinches. So it would be 9.0 uh, earthquake and the capacity. In the second to the last, whereas mm -hmm. first page. 9.0 being in the first whereas. I do have the second. So we have you a. Didn't want to make the motion. Did that's you? fine. I presented the item. It's fine. No, it's fine. Supervisor McCowan uh, is the maker of the motion, and Supervisor Hamburg is a second. Do we have any discussion from uh, the public on the motion?
Valenzuela with Assemblyman Wesley Chesbro's office. And I think everything's been said. I just wanted to reiterate that we have a letter, our office has a letter ready to go to the governor's office. Um, upon your passage, we'll walk it down to the governor's office. And also, if we can be of any assistance, please let us know and we'll continue to be in touch with the Harbor District. Thank you. <coughs> Jeff Tyrrell from Senator Noreen Evans' office. Uh, Senator Noreen Evan, Evans wholeheartedly supports the pending resolution of the Mendocino County Board of Supervisors declaring a local emergency related to the March 11th, 2011 tsunami event. The Noyo Harbor is a vital part of California, California's Mendocino Coast. The Senator is concerned about the estimate, estimated four million in tsunami damages to the Noyo Harbor and the potential annual income loss of 172,000 should these necessary repairs not be made. Senator Evans recognizes the importance of the fishing industry in our community and the urgency of repairing the estimated 800 to 1,000 feet of docks that were destroyed <coughs> as, part, as quickly as possible. Lastly, Senator Evans commends the quick responses and concerted efforts of the Mendocino County Sheriff's Office, California Emergency Management Agency, the Noyo Harbor District, the Mendocino County Board of Supervisors, as well as Congressman Mike Thompson and Assembly Member Wes Chesbro. She offers the support of this resolution as well as a personal request to the Governor for assistance. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion on the motion? Okay, uh, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, <coughs> say no. Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Thank you all very much. Okay, we will go to agenda item number four. This is the consent calendar to the board. Supervisor Pinches. Madam Chair, I'd like to pull item number uh, 12 just for a uh, I, I guess I can make a quick comment on it. I, really, I don't really want to pull it. I just want to make sure that this letter is sent to all the other the other uh, counties too. It's not listed. Oh yeah, it will be. Sorry. Because it's not CC'd to them, but, but it will be. Okay. So does that cover your concerns? Yeah. Okay, we're not concern. pulling that, and no. we'll move on to Supervisor Brown. Um, thank you, Chair Smith. That was also my concern. Um, having attended the 611, right. yeah. we need to CC the other counties yeah, that involved. Was an <coughs> thank you. We'll make sure that gets done. Great. Okay. Seeing no other uh, comments on the consent, we will go to public comment on the consent calendar. Seeing none, returning to the board uh, for a motion. I'll move, move approval. Second. Okay, we have an action uh, for approval from Supervisor McCallum with a second from Supervisor Brown. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Okay, moving right along and making up considerable time. Um, I'd like to go to our CEO. Uh, as she knows clearly where we are with respect to the afternoon agenda, I believe that we um, should accomplish what we can until our <laughs> noon recess. So wh where would you like to go next to the CEO? Uh, would thank, that be your Thank you, Madam Chair. We'd go to your report. We and can. Then, My report will just take a couple okay, minutes. Let's do that first. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and I'm hoping that the board all has a copy of my CEO report. Just a comment, I do have the emergency update listed first on the CEO report, and you've obviously done the declaration already. Um, this afternoon, uh, if you look through the budget, you'll see that uh, this afternoon we are uh, talking, uh, working with our consultant, Steve Swybeck, and doing another uh, workshop on budget update. Uh, I think the um, other items from February 15th that we brought forward regarding the options list, uh, some of those will come on March 22nd and then on April 5th. So we continue to, to work on other options <coughs> as cost-cutting <coughs> measures. On March 3rd, we participated in a phone conference with Fitch Ratings regarding our pension obligation bond 
rating, and that was the auditor, our treasurer, myself, and Mr. Knopp. And we've been answering questions from Fitch over the past week or so, and we're hoping to get a final decision on our credit rating. Again, this is standard. It happens every year. Nobody's uh, attempting to apply for any bonds, but it is a rating, and it, it does help us. It lets us know where we are. Um, and then, let's see. Uh, under executive office updates, um, we're still uh, hoping that we can uh, get a couple interns to work with us in the executive office and with the clerk of the board staff. And I think we just have some highlights there for March 22nd. Uh, we'll have a retirement system presentation for Mr. Jim Anderson. And then, of course, the sheriff's already mentioned the tsunami exercise. So I think those are probably just the highlights for today. Good. Thank Any you. questions from the board? Supervisor McCowan. Uh, just a comment. Clearly, the board took a formal action with regard to the business improvement district, which certainly did uh, take that item off the table in terms of cuts or elimination. With regard to the museum, it's my recollection that the, the comments by the board were to the effect that there was no interest in closing the museum, which had been the proposal but there was no formal action taken and given the budget situation we're still in, I don't know that we should uh, rule out the possibility of any cuts to the museum. I think what we ruled out was closure of the museum. Supervisor Brown. Um, I tend to agree um, with Supervisor McCown the fact that we did not take action, so we need to have it come back and and discuss it and take formal action. Yes, that was uh, there was no action. It wasn't slated for any action, so there wasn't any action proposed to be taken. I don't believe the way it was agendized, and we received basically a report from the library. Uh, uh, advisory board a, as well as the library director so we you received that museum. We, I'm you sorry museum museum, yeah. museum <laughs> thinking about later today <laughs> the, from the museum advisory board and from the museum director so um, so I concur that we took no formal action um, so supervisor Hamburg did you want yeah, I'm just just curious if the um, advisory board and the director heard it differently You know, I, uh, Madam Chair, Supervisor Hamburg, I, I think I would be curious as to whether they heard it differently as well. Um, certainly the museum director and I have spoken uh, since the workshop. And if you look at the museum budget, it's approximately 200,000 and 226,000. So certainly we're looking at the museum uh, participating in any budget reductions as far as net county costs for fiscal year 11-12. Uh, as far as doing anything differently, it was an assumption I made, and albeit it may be incorrect, uh, to take the museum off the list of options. We certainly can bring it back, and we can look at ways to operate the museum that may be more cost effective. I don't know. The, muse the museum has been in front of this board, I, I think, probably three times at this point, and so I was just uh, thinking that by some consensus this board wasn't considering any changes to the museum but certainly I can bring it back uh, and and repackage some of the options uh, with the administration of the museum that I've brought to you before I believe um, uh, Ms. Angelo that uh, the discussion sort of circulated around the concept of gee in the past they had had four or five staff now they were down to two they're operating on a bare bones budget with something that is actually under two hundred thousand but I think that's that still doesn't necessarily answer the question about exactly how that less than two hundred thousand dollar amount would be allocated or spent so there would be maybe room for discussion in that arena but I think it was more along the lines of they have been downsized down to what's currently two positions how that actually would look there might be some options about how that money was expended, but okay. that's sort of my recollection yeah. of it. Okay. Um, again, my error. I will. I will bring it back with the other options. Uh, it will either be March 22nd or April 5th. Any other? I see 
for board members that want to still comment. So uh, do you get apparently, it? it does need to be agendized I guess for further so. discussion. So should we just drop all of our comments now, or do you want to continue? We'll just drop it and we'll we'll bring Why it back. Why don't we just bring it back? Okay. I I, I does that work? just want to mention a concern that I had. I asked numerous questions that I think were very important to the conversation. Um, and I, I hope that uh, the advisory committee and the museum director were taking notes because I think that's part of the decision-making process um, that we need to go through when we talk about budget for the museum or we're, what we're going to do and how we go forward. Thank you. Supervisor Pinches. I think this is very unfair to the library uh, or the museum advisory board uh, for the simple reason, you know, we had a, a morning basically discuss the museum and the museum told us what their plans were and a very ambitious progress. And all of a sudden we, you know, why didn't we make this indication? Well, we're thinking about cutting you further. We're down to two positions. We have our interim director that operates as basically our curator and other functions too. I don't know what, you know, without, I guess we could go and have our jail staff run the museum if that's what you're talking about further cuts but we are what you call if there's a definition of bare bones we're there at the museum so but i just think you know there was no indication when we had the workshop on the museum of we're going to basically decimate the museum further there was no indication none none of the five of us give that indication they give us their plan what they their ambitious plan what they want to do and nobody on this board spoke up and gave any indication that we're going to decimate that department further and so I think it's very unfair to have this discussion here and to, to basically to, to redirect the Carmel to put it back on to further decimate the museum. I just, I feel that's very unfair to the museum board. Supervisor Hamper. We Hampton. should have give that indication then, not this morning when nobody's here. Supervisor, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say I, I agree with, um, uh, with my colleague. <clears throat> and I, I think if there were, you know, there is a point at which you cut the museum so much that you really are getting rid of the museum as part of the county organization. And I, my understanding, and a lot of it was formed uh, in that hearing or in that uh, workshop, was that we're, we're really at that point. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, if all county departments have to take 10 percent, that the, mu the museum would not have to also take 10%. But if we're really talking about like taking some of their F, their full-time equivalents away, which is, as Supervisor Pinch has stated, is down to two, um, I don't think we gave that impression at all. And I walked out of that workshop thinking that we had made a commitment to, to a, I don't know even know if the word came up, maintenance of effort, you know, to maintain county support for the museum the same as we are for other county departments. We're not getting rid of the planning department. We're not getting rid of the building department. We're not getting rid of the public health department. And my impression that day and my understanding that day was that we're not getting rid of the museum. And so, you know, I really feel the way, uh, the way John does on this. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit surprised that we're having this discussion. Well, I, I Madam believe- Chair. Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, but I've been waiting each. to be recognized, <laughs> and all of my colleagues have spoken. Well, I have not spoken yet. Supervisor Brown has. Uh, where's your marker? You, <laughs> Supervisor, you're the one that began the discussion, so you've spoken <coughs> once already. Is that correct? Yes, I okay. have. Okay. But I've also raised my markers since then, and you've called on other people who. They've uh, each only spoken once, Supervisor. It's called a prerogative of the chair. It's they've each spoken once. No one is avoiding Go on you. Go as you wish, Madam Chair. It's not. I, I, each person has spoken once. Is that once, 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 once? Madam right. Chair, would you please proceed? Okay. So, Supervisor Brown, what would you? You would just say you put your marker down. I watched you. I turned over there. You put it back up. Yeah. You obviously, said we're, we're having a discussion that's not on the agenda at this point. It would be better to have a discussion that is agendized. I agree, but, but since everyone's making comments, I have comments to make, but you do too, so please proceed. No, my point is that each supervisor was going to get to speak We're once. We're beyond that, Madam Chair. No, we've each all spoken once, except the chair. Please so, speak. So each has spoken once, and then we were gonna put it back on the agenda. Okay. 
My sense about it is that uh, the discussion that was left, the open part of the discussion, was more along the lines of the public-private partnership concept and the methodology in which that was being brought forward, what would be the appropriate roles to be played, and that there was considerably more work and dialogue that needed to happen regarding everybody's roles and responsibilities in that, and that that was the item that was going to come back to the board. That's my recollection, that that was, that was a strong piece of what, what needed to happen and was not resolved. Uh, there were other questions that Supervisor Brown had regarding the appointments uh, to the Library Advisory Board, her concerns about that. Museum. I, I, <laughs> museum. I do this all the time, not just today. And, um, and I have had a discussion with staff in their efforts to try to iron out lots of complexities about the appointment process, not just relative to the museum board. But we made considerable headway, and I could have the clerk maybe walk us through what, what progress has been made on that. Your appointment and my appointment are the two that are the outstanding with the most uh, time delay that needs to get worked out. But in that discussion, we came upon some other issues that need to be resolved, and I think we're ready to, to have that discussion. So maybe that should be bar, uh, brought back as part of the uh, the discussion of the museum, and we could we could touch on all these points. So does that work, Madam Chair? Yes, Supervisor. Thank you. Just for the record, this is at least the second time you've spoken to the issue because you already said what you have just now said again. <laughs> now, obviously, I'm swimming upstream on this, but what was said at that hearing, and again for the record, it wasn't agendized as a report. It was agendized with every item on the agenda being an action item. However, we did not take action. Uh, what we did say quite clearly was that we did not favor closing the museum. But I don't see how in the current budget environment where we are currently in a deficit, we have been perpetually in a deficit. We have actually been in deficit since 2005 where we know we are facing millions of additional uh, expenses in the next fiscal year and millions more in the fiscal year after that, I don't see how we can responsibly rule out the possibility that there may be a more efficient way to administer the museum. Uh, when you have a staffing ratio of one department head to one employee, maybe there's another model that we could look at that would provide for efficient administration of the museum and free up additional funds that could actually be used to support the museum and still realize the cost savings. So, you know, I just object to the idea that we're going to go down the line and we're going to rule everything out uh, for potential savings when there may be more efficient ways to do our business. Okay, fair enough. To the CEO, so maybe she could wrap up yeah. this discussion, her right. report, and then we're going to break right. for lunch. Okay, so um, it's very clear you to me I that to uh, I will <laughs> I will plan to bring the museum back. I think that uh, there there may be some efficiencies that we can we can still achieve with the museum based on how that museum is operated. I will contact the uh, museum director and have her here, and we'll work together on this. And I will bring it back at this point. I would like to bring it back on April 5th, if that will work for this board. Okay. And then by th by then, I think we will have all the uh, we will have gone through all the options except the Williamson Act. We need a little more time, and I need to okay. work with our chief counsel on that. Yes. Very briefly, and I believe we also, uh, by consensus, gave direction that we certainly supported the museum moving forward with developing the public-private partnership. But that's likely to be a, a long-term project. So I think another item on for discussion on April 5th should be uh, what are the other options for a permanent, stable source of funding for the museum? Okay. To Ms. Angela, do you have other um, comments or things you'd like to discuss in your report? Nothing else, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Okay, great. So we... Uh, We'll uh, break until uh, 1 30. It says 1. 1. 1 o'clock. Good. Good point. That's right. Come back here, right. 1 o'clock. So we have an hour and lunch. We come break. Back and here. we come back here and then we go down to see you later. Yep. You're going to have to say.
coming up three minutes past one on March 15th, and we are going to agenda item number 6B. This is informational presentation regarding Mendocino County's general liability cost allocation program, and the sponsoring department is the General Services Agency. We will go to the director. Well, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Kristen McMinimi, your GSA director. And I have an informational item that was actually requested by a previous board member, Supervisor Colfax, in, I believe it was no, uh, maybe September, October, November of 2010. So we are, I'm back here before you today to just kind of describe to you the cost allocation method that is used by um, our risk management department to allocate our, our, our risk out to the departments. We basically take the entire total risk management budget and we, um, in that risk management budget is all of our operating costs for risk management as well as all the insurance premiums uh, for our general liability program. That equals our total risk management budget. We take that total amount and we allocate it to all the different departments and it's based on a couple of criteria. One is their experience and that is um, that has a weighted rate of 80 percent in, in the calculation and the others are square footage personnel count their budgeted travel and their building values, those are considered factors as far as their exposure rate, and that's a 20% rate, and that ends up equaling the 100%, which then equals their premiums. And so um, I've also attached in this agenda summary just, I, I pretty much know, only because I've been doing this for a very long time, a lot, of, a lot of what the other counties are doing, but I went and had, had my staff member just call a couple of counties, and I mean, we called probably like 36 counties left messages. This is the, these are who responded in an appropriate time. And you can kind of see it's, we're in the same, along the same lines as, you know, the remainder of the counties. I will tell you that um, we, we use our general liability experience um, on a five-year basis. We take five years of experience and we keep it on the books and then every year a, a previous year falls off. We used to have a 10-year experience rate. So you'd have, if you had a bad experience, that would be on your record for 10 years. That was switched to five years in fiscal year 0304 by myself and the auditor at that time, Dennis Huey, and my predecessor, Bruce Mordehorst. Um, because the trend at that time uh, in my research was showing going from 15 to 10 year down to five, sometimes even to three. I will tell you that in my conversations with CSAC, they're looking at moving up. They've moved up their workers' comp from a five year to a 10 year experience. We're not there on the liability. We're doing very well, so I don't see a need to make that change upward to a 10 year experience. What that means is for the department, um, you know, if they have a bad experience, it'll drop off within, you know, after your five years is done versus a 10 year time frame. Um, I've also attached here for just for your review what, what I submitted to the auditor last year, uh, which is the cost allocation for every single um, budget unit or department that is allowed, you know, because sometimes some grants don't have a provision for you to charge um, any type of a risk management, you know, premium. So those are not included, but the majority, every single budget unit is, is in the cost allocation system. Now, as it pertains to the library, the library in uh, fiscal year 10-11 paid out $148,427, which is also in, shown in the attached spreadsheet. And they suffered a large claim in March 2004, and the county paid a total of $175,000 plus uh, on that particular claim. The insurance picked up 106. So the total amount of the claim, you know, was over 200,000 almost $300,000. And the county had a stop loss of 150 at that time, so the county picked up that, but we also had to pay an additional 25,000 above and beyond that um, $150,000 self-insured retention because this claim had an involvement where there was some policy exclusions, and so the insurance company did not pick that up and we were stuck with that as well. So we issued the settlement payment in January of 07. So basically what you're looking at is that particular case will drop off the library's experience in fiscal year 13-14. And I went through and I looked just to let you know that when that experience drops off, if there are no other claims between now and 13-14 large <laughs> claims, the, li the uh, library's experience, you know, as far as their, um, and as long as insurance premiums don't go up between now and then either, you're looking at $13,000 will be um, 
you know, it'll be significantly reduced from the current 148 to $13,000 when that um, claim drops off. There is also an auditor comment um, in the staff report um, from the county auditor. Um, I don't see her here, but uh, during fiscal years 08, 09, and 09, 10, I'll just let me back up for a second. Risk management submits the cost allocation plan, this document that you see here. I submit it to the auditor every year, and then she charges out departments, and then magically the money just appears in uh, budget unit 0713 every year. So um, in fiscal year 08, 09, and 09, 10, the library paid reduced shares of the general liability insurance, she's stating, um, because she had found some outside funding to go ahead and offset that general fund expense. And um, she's showing that you've got a total of 345 plus thousand dollars in total that at some point will need to be reimbursed to where those funds came from. So she's not here to answer any of those questions. I think um, um, Ms. McMenemy will go to questions sure. first with Supervisor Yeah, that, that, Supervisor that's pretty McCallum. much it. That's, that's the sum of your report, mm -hmm. okay. So Supervisor Pinches? Well, <clears throat> the whole process of general liability insurance, I understand how it's makeup, but let's just isolate the county library, okay? They had a $287,000 claim is what you add up that was a total claim for. In the first year, they paid $148,000, and then consequently, it was a couple years in, but, but still, their payment is still $148,000. If I had an insurance policy that I would have to pay any kind of a premium and then have to pay basically in a two-year premium the cost for the full uh, cost of a, of a claim, then I don't even think I would call that insurance. I'm that's just basically yeah. paying, uh, that's what you call self-insured, where you pay the claim yourself. I mean, if you look mm -hmm. at the total cost that the, that the library's incurred for that $287,000, there's been no benefit whatsoever for the library to be in the pool. As a matter of fact, I remember one time uh, Mike Sweeney made the argument for, in the Solid Waste Division, because they had a large claim, that they'd been a lot better off if they had a, a private insurance policy, if you remember that argument that yes I remember that the solid waste uh -huh. and, and that's certainly the case I mean you know and keep in mind before this claim happened the library or the uh, yeah the library was paying probably I'm, I'm assuming close to the thirteen thousand dollars a year annual payment anyway so they were paying an insurance premium for years before this claim come around and then all of a sudden it's two hundred and Eighty-seven thousand dollar claim happens, and then in a two-year period, they got to pay out more than the total claim. Okay. And so, that is so. The Pinches. argument is, why did they pay for the years of the uh, of the general liability premium in the first place? And this is no different than any other department. You have the sheriff who I just paid out a very large claim for. We we maxed out our hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and the sheriff is going to have to carry that on his books for five years. Okay, and the best way for me to give an example as to why this why this is supposed to work this way and why this keep in mind this is a, this is something that was uh, given to us from the state auditors as a cost allocation method along with all California counties across across the state this is this is the way it is done because if you think of it this way you have your vehicle insured you get in a very bad accident you may cause hundreds of thousands of damage and medical issues to somebody else and it's your fault. Your insurance is going to increase anywhere between five and ten years. If you got a, a DUI, your insurance is going to increase because you have bad experience on your driving record. You get too many tickets, you know, you, you, that's how this cost allocation works. They have a bad experience and therefore this, it's, it's supposed to act, if you talk to the state auditors, cost allocation programs are supposed to act as though it's a deterrent. It's supposed to make people aware of their risk, what's going on, put pro proper procedures and policies and whatever they need to keep in place so that the same incident doesn't happen again. So we used to have a 10 year, you know, experience claims experience and so I mean I guess the library is lucky that we don't have a 10 year and so are all the other departments it's a five year but you're going to have departments that probably pay a very minimum amount then they may end up having a large claim um, 
where it's a big significant impact and they're going to have five years of a higher experience rated level and that is no different than any other California county that runs their program whether they're self-insured or not they still take the risk management program even if we were fully insured we would still have a risk management program. You would take, the premiums would be a, a lot higher if we, if we took our self-insured 150,000 self-insured retention and went fully funded. You're still gonna have, and you're still required to by the state to have a cost allocation program in place. Some counties are going to a 90% experience level. I've kept it at an 80-20, but I am seeing a trend of going back to the 10 years. I don't know really why that is, because I think we're doing fine, other than the fact in the two risk managers that I've spoken to this past week, it was because there was a feeling of departments weren't getting the hint and they weren't addressing their claims issues and a lot of claims could have been prevented had they followed proper you know, procedures and policies, if you will. So that is my explanation for how that works. And I know to some people that may sound really strange, you're, you're overpaying. And you can kind of look at it, I'll be really frank with you, it's kind of like a punishment, almost. You know, you're being penalized because you've had very bad experience on your insurance. So that's, that's how I can explain that, Supervisor Pinchas. Do all counties do this, basically, in a, in a way this is a form of self-insurance, really, is to set aside money. I mean, that's kind of what the pool is. But is, is he ever, have you ever looked into, or CSAC, I don't realize CSAC runs this program in, in the, the whole for, I guess, I don't know about all the counties, but most of them. Uh, has everybody, is anybody thought about or, or took the option of going out into the private market to insurance companies and see if, you know, if they would insure, say, the county's general liability and give us a, a cost that? You know, that, that way it would be, that way when you, you would have an annual premium that may be more, but you wouldn't have any of these spike ups because you basically wouldn't be paying for your own losses because it'd be spread out. I mean, I'm just saying if you went with a, say a company like Allstate or something that, that has, that would insure you, you know, that, that they, they project their their cost allocations through a, right. a broader base. Ours is pretty small. Well, I mean, what they would do is they would, well, it's not it's not small in that you look at all the other counties My question are involved, is, have you ever compared you, it to if got I, a private? If I go out and compare it and say, all state, I want you to ensure our risk management function and take it away from CSEC. And whether we're self-insured or not, it, it really kind of doesn't matter. Let's say we're not gonna, we're gonna go fully loaded. They're gonna say, okay, Kristen, your premium is a million dollars, okay? we still have to have a cost allocation method to charge that back to departments so that they all pay in unless the board is willing to say we're going to set and we're going to give you a net county cost of a million dollars plus whatever you know overhead you might have in well, risk what management the premium would be based on they give you a total cost and then depends on what what claims you want to like to like if the county covered the first hundred hundred fifty thousand right. dollars which is kind of Just what we're like doing we do anyway mm -hmm. okay then it would certainly that brings the premium down but then the cost allocation would be spread over all departments evenly and just because somebody had a accident or something and we experienced with solid waste and now the, uh, the library it wouldn't spike up to be 10 times or, or more than what the, the total li liability claim was in a two-year period i mean and i'm not so sure about that because again have we ever have if, we ever even looked into that yes if you have and it's this is a question and i wish meredith were here for the auditor because the state auditor comes in and, and requires you to have a cost allocation system where in we would get an audit exception and i checked on this yesterday i said what if the county decided that we wanted to exempt the library from 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 you know contributing right or or cap it at whatever where and we would receive when the state auditor comes in i was told we the county would receive an audit exception for that because that is not an auditing practice that the state is willing to be okay with you have to have a system where it's not just evenly but it's got to be based on certain factors you've got to base it on experience and you've got to base it on exposure now if we went out and decided to go to all state um and let's say and and they would still, to know less, they would give us a premium, just like CSEC does. CSEC says, here's your premium for being part of our program. Here's your premium. 
and it, it's going to be a much better deal than what if I go out and shop. Trust me, we've done this, and and I can give you those numbers. But CSAC gives us the premium. The county is the one who's responsible for creating the cost allocation system with the state auditor and the county auditor. And this is the cost allocation system that they've adopted. And if there's any way, you know, <coughs> I've asked Meredith and talked to her about certain ways of doing things, and then I went out and did my research, and you have some counties that have a cap um, for certain, you know, but it's a cap for everybody. You can't just single out a small department just because they're small, a small department. That's just not, the state auditor is going to give us an exception when they come in for that. Excuse me, and Madam Chair, the auditor yes. is on her way. Okay. So she should be here before 1.30. Okay, well, let's go to Supervisor McCowan. He had a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the state uh, mandates that we have a system, and they've provided a model, but it's not mandated that we use that specific model. The model used to be 70-30 in a 10-year when I first got into risk management, and I changed that based on the trend that other California counties right, up to 80-20 and then a five-year period. So my point, we can adjust that model based on what we wish to decide, as is, long as so we have a model that apportions the cost among all the departments. And it's so long as it's approved by the state. And that is really something for the auditor. I mean, if you look at it, risk is sort of, I'm the person that takes the numbers, puts it in, gives a spreadsheet to Meredith, and she charges the departments. Um, so I noticed that uh, Nevada County does use 80% allocated to experience, but they cap it at $25,000 per claim. Right. Because the situation we've run into here, uh, with the example of the library, they're getting hammered a very significant amount in relation to their budget and they're getting hammered five years in a row for a claim that happened one year and then uh, I believe it's been indicated to me that this wasn't a claim that necessarily was primarily attributable to the actions of the library or their decision but to a decision that was made by people higher up the food chain no, that's incorrect. Well, that's incorrect. We don't. I don't think we need to refight that entire battle. But uh, a different. My understanding is a different decision could have been made much earlier in the process that would not have resulted in the adverse claim, which was the settlement of a court case, was it not? This a lawsuit. Yeah, this involved uh, an employee who was prosecuted for theft and embezzlement. And um, in that, in the course of that prosecution, the county took em an employment action. Once the prosecution was over and, it, and the employee was acquitted, then her employment action kicked back in. And I think, as I recall, the majority of the settlement is back wages. Yes. Right, but it all stemmed from the fact that this employee was alleged to have done certain things and uh, at trial that was not proven. And so, again, That's correct. someone made the decision that they wanted to uh, go down the road of assuming that this person was the one responsible for the missing funds. Yeah, and I have, I have no idea about that. I mean, this case happened even before I came back. So, so again, without... When I got, after I came back. Without re replaying that whole scenario, there's the potential that the library winds up paying for a settlement that they weren't necessarily responsible for. It's, uh, and, I, and I, I understand the point that you want the departments to tighten up their practices so they're avoiding unnecessary claims, but you could build that into, you could build that into the table. Sorry. You could build that into the table, so you know, I, I think we could look at a model of saying we're going to cap it at so much per claim. If it's clear that the claim resulted from the department not following the practice. Yeah, How many I'm, conversations I'm, would you like to have? I'm trying no, I, to ask. I, I'm trying I'm to ask you a question. I, I'm thinking about your 25 cap, and you absolutely can. I, I don't know, and that's okay, a and question the second, for the auditor. The part is if you can do it for everybody, or if you can just make select rules. And the second part of the question would be then if, if you uh, determine that the claim resulted from the department not following the 
the proper practices, then the cap could go up to 50,000 per claim, something like that. So there'd still be some weight given to you weren't following the proper procedures. Because I'm, you know, in the case of the museum, if they got hit with a $150,000 claim or 200,000, that would totally wipe out their budget. What are they supposed to do then? And what recourse would there be? So, you know, I, I think there's some policy considerations here that the board really ought to be looking at. And I'm also reading the report was the first time that I heard that the library was going to be expected to pay back the additional funds that had been, you know, discovered, I think, in the child support budget. My understanding was that was general fund money that was then being allocated uh, to cover the, the cost for the library. And now we're being told it has to be paid back, so. Ms. Ford. Hello. Good afternoon. <laughs> Meredith Ford, Auditor Controller. Um, regarding the, uh, the borrowing of funds from the outside source for the library, those, the understanding has always been that those funds will need to be paid back eventually um, as the economic outlook improves there's there's never been any question about that on on either side so were those general fund monies no they were restricted for use only by the contributing department yes except that there was there was an instance where that department had more of an allocation than it could reasonably expect to spend and he offered to to help the library through this downtime and I've thought that in the past though that that department was able to make a general fund contribution to the county they make a general fund contribution in the amount of their a87 costs and not in additional revenue that they may receive I, 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 I guess I've been misinformed I've been I believe I've been told in the past that it actually was a money maker for the county. Not in recent times, no. Okay, we're going to a second comment. Supervisor yeah, just Finches. a qu question. Uh, Kristen, this is agendized for the county's general liability cost allocation program. Uh, you're not going to go into the actuarials and whatnot, where we are, our status in those accounts no, today? No, not today, sir. You'll be coming forward in the near future with a report on that? During budget, it'll okay. be given to the CEO. Okay, but in general, our actuarial accounts are probably experienced at a level of funding greater than is historically been a level at. Yes, that's correct. I, yeah. So that opens up some revenues for and our... And I'm, I'm aware of that. I'm just kind of waiting for... You know, I just paid out a yeah. large claim, so I've got to wait and see where exactly. we're going to be. And, and it's just about projecting for next fiscal year. I've already yeah. done the budget for next fiscal year and what the estimated premiums are, so I'll... But it could be a cost savings or contribution for next fiscal year. It could be... Yeah, uh, a portion of it will because a portion of those dollars were given yeah. by non-general fund but departments. But the last time you give us an uh, actual report, huh? that was a considerable... We could right. reduce that by about 20% and give us a general fund savings of a pretty significant amount. Yeah. And we'll work with that Meredith on yeah. getting Thank that number yeah. firmed up. Supervisor Hamburg. Yeah. <clears throat> Kristen, just, just so I'm really clear on this. So we paid out $175,000 for this 04 claim, right? And that doesn't count the... Microphone, Supervisor. Oops. That doesn't count the increase in our overall insurance due to having a claim. So is that what, what puts it up in the 200 Plus thousand category. We paid well. We paid out a hundred and one hundred forty-eight thousand dollars is the amount of premium that the library has paid out last fiscal year, according to. Yeah, the cost I'm trying allocation. to get back to to, to the initial the, hit on yeah, our. the initial hit was we paid one hundred fifty for a stop plus plus stop an additional plus. twenty-five. So it was one hundred and seventy-five thousand okay. dollars total that the county's general liability program got hit with. Right. For that particular okay. claim. So for 05, 06, 06, 07, you know, for five fiscal years after that, the library has paid, what, what is the total the library has paid in general liability costs since that $175,000 hit? Uh, I don't have that in 
Um, almost half a million dollars. Yeah. That's good insurance. It's though. just, you know, but if it, you look it really, it's, I mean, I, I heard all the explanations, but they just don't compute. Sheriff <clears throat> have does we the same. ever, Everybody have we ever had a case like this where a small department has been hit to this degree? Yes, the solid yeah, waste solid department. Waste. The sol solid waste department. Okay. And I'm sure there are others. I could go back and look. Okay. And just let me ask you, um, it, just following up on Supervisor McGowan's uh, comment about Nevada County, why can't we institute a cap as Nevada County has for smaller departments? I believe that would be in violation of the state controller's policy with regard to the allocation of general liability insurance. Um, if we don't um, go by or abide by what the state controller says the formula should be, then those costs would then be unallowable for claiming with all of our state and federal funds. So we wouldn't be able to include them if they weren't allocated as according to what the state controller says they have to do. So how are these two other counties getting away with that? I have no idea. Maybe we should find out. I mean, this, this is a totally disproportionate hit on the library. And we, we know how bad off the library is, you know. Now they're, you know, they're going to be talking today about um, trying to impose a sales tax that's going to take a two-thirds vote, you know, just to survive in their kind of skeletal way. And here they've paid out half a million dollars plus for a $175,000 loss to the county. It just does not compute in my mind. Okay, before we go back to the board, I'd like to go to public comment on the topic. Anyone wishing to address the board on this item, please come forward. Afternoon, I'm Greg Urock. I'm a uh, businessman in Point Arena, and I'm also the vice president of Friends of Coast Community Library. I also don't quite understand how it is that we uh, please, please speak into the microphone. We, the library, are being held accountable for a decision that appears to have been made over in county council. Clearly, I don't think the library department initiated this action against the employee, so it was sort of out of our hands. It seemed to be based on county council's judgment. District attorney. Anyone else wishing to address District the topic? Attorney. If I could respond to that, I'm sure. sorry. Um, do. With regard to the prosecution of the employee, the library made a report to the auditor's office. The auditor's office did an investigation. We met with the DA. The DA decided to prosecute. That's, that's how it went. And if I could also add that the insurance company, because we did have um, particular insurance for the amount of money that was was alleged to be embezzled, um, we had a deductible. That's separate and aside from all this and was not included in any experience or any payout. We, I filed an insurance claim and I had auditors coming from um, several different companies come in and we had to box up everything that we had that the auditor had and they had approved the claim based on the evidence that they had found. So the county, the library, they received those funds back. Okay. Melanie Light, Body County Librarian. I just wanted to say about that, that it was indeed um, the responsibility of the library's practices that had this claim, just for accuracy's sake. Because there weren't proper cash handling policies in place? I was not here at that time, but I think that they definitely could not, could have been tighter. I think that's accurate. Thank you. So, any more public comment on the topic? Okay, we're go I'm going to go back to the board. Supervisor Pinches, you've already had two times to speak on this topic, <laughs> so we're going to go to uh, and Supervisor. And why you say you're coming back to the board then? I am, but not to you. <laughs> I just have another question. So. Ma Madam Chair, I'll uh, defer to my colleague. Oh, don't, please don't. Not now. <laughs> it's your turn. No, it's my discretion. I defer to Supervisor Okay, Supervisor Pinches. Pinches, and then we'll go to Supervisor what McCown. What is the total general liability premium policy the county of Mendocino pays? 
And keep in mind, this is not only the premium, this is also the entire amount that would be allocated to all departments, no matter what. And but it's $1.7 million. This is stri stri strictly the general liability. Yes, $1.7 million is the total. And in that is all the operational costs as well as the insurance premium. And that's with a $150,000 deductible, right? Yes. That seems like a large amount. Of, that should get you. <laughs> it should get you a lot. I, I, I just think that we maybe should look around. Is that and it? I know everybody wants to stick with CSAC, but I think there may be better deals out there. Is that all? Yes, that's it. Okay, Supervisor McCallum. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> well, I want to go back to the think? cap issue because well, these other think. counties yeah, do yeah. seem to be doing this. And I think Supervisor Hamburg phrased it in terms of a cap for small departments. But if the cap applied to all departments, uh, it would be on an equal basis. And I don't know why the state wouldn't approve that. And then the balance that otherwise would have gone to experience could be prorated based on the other factors. Are we certain that that would not be allowable? According to, to my knowledge of this, which is I haven't really gone through and, and looked at each um, component of the allocation. My understanding is that the way we're doing it now is as the state controller prescribes. Um, I'm sure that, sure that we can contact the state controller's office and find out if there is an alternate method that we could employ. I would appreciate uh, specifically knowing could we have a cap as others appear to do. Um, the chair has a few questions. Um, Ms. McMenemy, I, I've been concerned about this issue for a number of years and bo uh, initially regarding the solid waste budget, a rather small budget or division within Department of Transportation, um, which clearly over the years was, it was said, well, it can't operate at a, at a zero sum game. And, I, and, and quite honestly, a lot of the burden of the operational costs was this claim. And if you look, I believe the solid waste one is about at the same level well, it's under roads, but I do believe it was solid waste. It's about at the same level of payment as... Solid waste, no, is no longer on this cost allocation right. because they were not charged last fiscal year. And but so they were. It was a huge amount a number of years It was the previous ago. fiscal year, yes. But okay. on this cost allocation, DOT it's is not, strictly it's just DOT. Okay, so what was the solid waste number? Do you have any idea? It must have been about $150,000 or Pretty maybe a little less. to a small department. Okay. Yeah. So, but, but I'd like to go back um, to just be really clear on um, how you're allocating or I guess more appropriately assigning risk. So, so we have the $175,000 figure I think you had from the library. And then that is, it's been repetitive over what, four or five fiscal years. So, so are you, I just wanna make sure that I'm getting this because it seems rather simplistic and, I, and maybe I have it wrong. So are you assigning the claim amount, the maximum claim total amount, and then you just assign that to the department for five consecutive years? What we do is we have a, a, a program in risk management, and any time a case or a lawsuit gets filed, an, a department is assigned to that. There's always some kind of a department that's associated with any claim. It's given a claim number, it's assigned, and so at the end of the fiscal year, I run a report based on um, department, budget unit, if you will, and then it tells me what claims are assigned to that particular department along with an amount. So um, if there's a vehicle accident, it's there, that's also kept track of because this is all inclusive, you know, as far as if risk is paying out any money. If I have to pay out any money at all, that money is always assigned to a particular claim with regards to judgment and damages. And keep in mind with this $1.7 million budget, $400,000 of that is what we t set aside to pay for our self-insured portion. So that's not in all insurance premium, and I just was wanting Supervisor Pinches to understand that portion as well. Well, I guess what my concern is the analogy you started with about the private insured uh, that would be in a vehicular accident and then their rates jump up. Mm -hmm. Granted, that is, in fact, of course, what does happen. But I don't, I, you know, maybe they're j they're, the rates jump up twofold or maybe threefold at the very most but then it's it's not comparable in other words I don't I don't think it's a good analogy because it's not it isn't taking the base rate of the library from the first point 
and then having that go up two or three fold. And again, this is a cost allocation system that the state has given us. I mean, we did tweak it and change it, but you know, if we want to change this in any way, it's going to come from the state and the auditor, and they're going to tell me what numbers I need to plug in. This is not something that risk gets to create and, and, and give. This is something that comes down from above. So I mean, as far as a, a cap goes, I'll have my staff look at those two counties and get with Meredith and see if there's something you know, but, that you know, can be done there. You're talking about tweak, tweaking and changing, and it just seems like what I'm getting from my colleagues, and, and also share this opinion, is that you know, there's got to be a more equitable internal way to do it. I don't really think that the state is, is I don't believe that there would be the inflexibility from departmental assignment that, that we're, we're discussing here. It would seem that the insured is Mendocino County. Mendocino County carries the liability. Of course, we have to find some way to assign uh, or allocate costs to various departments. I mean, I think that, that logic seems to hold. But I think the, where, where it falls apart is after a claim is experienced, there's got to be another way to then spread that risk. So yes, you want to be able to have buy-in from depart the, the department um, managers and staff for safety issues and best practices and protocols and the law. That would be clear, right? But sometimes things are unavoidable, or some things, sometimes things occur that all those things are in place with their due diligence, and things still happen. So it just seems to me that it, it defies logic that it would could wreak havoc to the degree that it appears in certain circumstances when it sort of befalls a rather small department. And there's got to be a better way of taking the dollar amount from a claim and absorbing that into the larger organization. I think everything makes sense up until that point. So if that's called assigning a cap, or if that's called an amount above X amount, gets then dispersed through the larger organization. So, in other words, that's the point of insurance is to spread risk. So, you, so when we're talking about hard one dollars in, in all departments, but in particularly in small departments, that then if they have to bear that burden and then they've got to borrow over here, get the money and then figure out ways to repay it, something's wrong with how it's seen through to the end, I would say. So I think we really need to look at how we do it in a more equitable fashion. Well, and a lot of that has to do with, I mean, either way you're going to have $1.7 million or right. it'll be less next year that has to be spread amongst the departments, okay? And so you have to base it on certain criteria. and. You could base it on, you know, 50% experience and 50% exposure, which means if you have a high claim, you, you know, maybe you won't get it, you won't get it hit as hard because it's only still based on 50% instead of 80, 20. But again, these are things that um, I don't have the authority to change. I've, from my understanding, is I just I have to run everything through the auditor and the state auditor and. And you know we can look at various options between Meredith and I and, and get back to you. But um, there there is different ways that you can do this. But it, again, you, from my understanding, you have to get approval from the state. Well, what I'm hearing from my colleagues is that we really need to look at a different way to do part of it anyway. So it doesn't disadvantage small departments, and it does have more of that equitable spreading of the risk. And I think there could be a conversation about falling following policies and protocols, sure. how does that interface with the claim, and then putting a cap on it. I mean, I think there's other options that would be more equitable for the county to implement. So and let's you know, go to Supervisor Brown. And you know, you can, based on the fact, let's say you have a small department that has zero experience and they only pay $8,000, let's say. If you did like a $25,000 cap, then again, you'd have to either you know, there's a lot of different things with auditing that you'd have to do in order to still spread the risk, which means those people who are paying less, they're now going to pay more because you have a department who maybe had a negative experience and maybe they're a small department. You know, if you push that down, then others are going to go up. So, and that's just. Supervisor Brown. Thank you, Chair Smith. Um, Ms. McMinimi, the. He, super, I'm going to Supervisor Pinches back to his question. And I thought I heard a response from you saying we do have a history of research that was done when we looked at the possibility of going with other insurance. 
Yeah, and, and CSAC also provides that information to their board of directors. Every single year they give us an, you know, that tells us if you would have went with another insurance program, because they're required to also go out and get quotes and compare their own policies and procedures. They're required to do that per the JPA that the county has signed on. So. Okay, we're running over on this topic. We've gone to public comment. We'll go to Supervisor Pinch's last call. Well, thank you. I didn't know you were going to recognize me. <laughs> I'd like to make a comment. Talk, we talked about the large claim at solid waste. Jerry Ward himself told me that when he took over the transfer stations, his insurance premium to carry those transfer stations and his liability policy was $27,000 a year. But yet it cost Mendocino County in the hundreds of, seven, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I'm not trying to dispute CSAC's claim or whatnot, but for my... We had $1.7 million you paid last year in premiums. That was your last No, year. it's not premium. That is the entire cost of risk management. $400,000 of that is what we have set aside to reserve to pay out our $150,000 worth of claims okay. and to, over the past eight years to build up that reserve, which was at zero. Okay. And now next year, we're going to be able to significantly reduce that budget. Okay. I mean, you're talking probably so you're talking maybe around about a 1.3 million dollar claim. I'm talking about 850, 900 thousand dollars worth of insurance, and okay. that's on our all of our facilities. And that, will be next that, year. that that's facilities. That's fire. That's that's our insurance on everything. Oh, all of our vehicles. General no general okay. liability. That's why it's called general. That's our tort litigation. Okay. You know, that's anytime we get sued. Okay. That's for all of our vehicles, buildings, how much claims, boats. How much claims did we pay out last year? I don't. I don't have that number. I mean, yeah. meaning our 150,000, I, I don't have that number right in front of me. It, it kind of, you know, it depends. Our cap is 150, and every time we pay out for vehicle insurance, because we have a $10,000 deductible for vehicles. So if a vehicle gets wrecked, we pay 10 grand. Insurance pays, you know, 35 or 40, depending on the vehicle, so that we can replace that vehicle. Yeah. And those costs are then attributed to departments. So in, also in this 1.7 is I have two personnel. Well, actually, it's one and a half personnel. And then you've you've got you know your office expense. It's very minimal. The rest of it is very minimal, but your bulk of it is the insurance premium and the four hundred thousand dollars that we set aside to pay our one fifties or to pay yeah. any kind of costs. I, I just wonder, you know, CSAC's basically customers. And can anybody ask the question? Is everybody does all fifty eight counties participate in this? CSAC. Yes, okay. in one way or another, in one in one the, program or another. Okay. The cost allocation is a total. We're trying to con mix things here. Cost allocation to departments is that's a total. That's ours. Exactly. That's a total that's different issue. That's not a CSAC than, thing. Than the insurance. Exactly. But what they're basically doing is covering their administrative costs and all their claims over basically 58 customers. Where if you went to a, a national insurance company, they're spreading their administration and their claims over hundreds of thousands of customers. And so that's why it drives down the cost of the premium. So I'm not saying that you're getting a bad deal from CSAC. I just think, you know, if I was gonna write a check for a million point three a year, I would certainly look around and make sure I got the best deal. And, and it's I, between 800 and 900,000 is our insurance yeah. premium. And you know, uh, that's fine. I, I can do that. I would just ask that I can do that after my April 5th presentation. Yeah. <laughs> So um, we're returning to the board now. This is not an action item. It's an informational presentation only. Uh, board members, any comments or certainly staff has heard the board comments. Uh, Supervisor Hamburg. Well, I would just like to make sure that the board's direction is clear. And if we don't need a motion to do that, that's fine. Yeah. But I, I, think, I think all of us would like to see if there are any alternatives that would be more attractive. With your goal of smaller departments not being hit so heavily. That, 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 that that's is my clear. goal. I mean, I can, you know, it's easy to understand why the sheriff's department, the jail need, right. you know, are gonna have to have, are gonna have a, a hefty amount that they have to pay for the liability It's the nature insurance. of the business. But it doesn't make sense that the library does. I mean, you know, I think that what happened with the library was kind of an anomaly and for them to suffer for five years with that much of their budget, you know, we don't have to reiterate. And but I'm happy, I, I, I'm happy know, to look at doing sure. things differently. I have no issues with that. It's okay. just a matter and of. So you will bring that back to us. Do we have to say a date certain or after April 5th? After, or? after, April, after yeah. April 5th would be great. 
Okay, well, I'll <laughs> just defer to the chair about how you want to. We'll, we'll make sure that happens. The clerk <coughs> is getting it on the list right now, I'm sure. And She's it's on, come it's back on my April list. And tell us we're getting a lot better deal here anyway next well, year. Well, yeah, because we're going to get some good news on April 5th. Yeah. Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we are moving on now to our next agenda item. Can Running we a just bit make late. that a standing order? Sure. Good, good news only. Yeah, good news good only. News That's only. all we're talking about today. <laughs> Okay, we are moving on to uh, item number 6C. And I believe the uh, department head, the library director, could introduce the item. Yes. Uh, oops, we have a little technical problem. <laughs> um, anyway, while we're waiting on that, yes. Um, I'm here to give you an overview of uh, library services and to talk about a little bit about what our options are going to be uh, for the future. <clears throat> oh, okay, thank you. did when we practiced it. Well, I'll go ahead and um, get started, but hopefully okay. we can, it would be very helpful. Okay. Chair Smith, ladies and gentlemen on the board, uh, our libraries are the heart of our communities. And I want to give you some facts and figures about our libraries. First, we have five branches, and they're located in our cities, and all of our branches serve our neediest children. If you were able to see on the PowerPoint, you would see that one of the key factors in identifying childhood poverty is free and reduced lunch. And our libraries serve anywhere from a free and free and reduced lunch level of 57.6 uh, all the way up to 100% in Round Valley Library. Fact two, we use many volunteers. Our staff to volunteer ratio is 18 to one. There are few other libraries in California that use that number that we do. Our paid staff is highly leveraged by volunteers. In fact, we couldn't stay open right now without our volunteers. Okay, so you can, you can see there that uh, our Coast Community Library has almost 60% free and reduced lunch. Round Valley has 100%. Okay, next. Okay, next. Fact five, Mendocino County spend, we have, excuse me, I am, excuse me while I take That's one okay. second. <laughs> that really threw me off. <laughs> All right, fact three, we have wonderful friends of the library. Friends of the library provide not only books and supplies and extras, but landscaping, and major renovation. And when it comes to our Coast Community Library and our Round Valley Library, they actually own the buildings that our libraries are in. And even now, our bookmobile friends of the library are raising funds so they can complete buying of that vehicle. Fact four, next. In two years, from 2006, seven to eight, nine, we had a 25% increase in usage. And obviously not a 25% increase in staff. And then once Willits and Fort Bragg closed on Fridays, we went down a little bit, but we're now again, even though Ukiah is closed, we're increasing our busyness again, even though we have less hours. Fact five, next. 
Mendocino County Library spend fourteen ninety three a year per capita each on each resident. The average for all of California is about $35. That's $20 less per person for services. Our county to the east of us, Lake, spends $20. North, Humboldt, $24. And then, of course, Rich Sonoma to the south actually spends about average. Next. Fact six, even though we spend a lot less money than most other libraries, we check out right about average. We're pretty close to what average is, right in the middle there. Average five, uh, statewide averages is, is 6.21. That is the number of items per resident that's checked out each year. Next. Fact seven. In 2008, 2009, out of 188 library jurisdictions in the state of California, Mendocino County is 176th in staffing level per population. Now since then, uh, we've lost staff. I don't know that our relative, since most libraries have cut, I don't know that our relative has changed any, but 176 libraries have more staff for their people than we do. I'm going to move on to revenue. You will see that our upcoming revenue will continue to go down. Uh, most of this is due to a couple of factors. One, uh, the state library, and I'll have just in a second, I'll have another slide on that, um, and also that money that I've been able to carry over Previously, I will not be able to carry over anymore because I will have used it. Um, next. And you can see that a majority of that loss that we've seen just recently, last five years, is loss of state funds. We had $400,000 in 06, 07, um, and now 11, 12, we may expect to have no money at all. Next. These are the expenditures that we are looking at coming up. You can see here that we will, we have cut uh, personnel, but our other expenses continue to either stay the same or to grow, in particular our facility costs. Next. And the one thing I wanted to let you know about expenditures is one of the biggest things that libraries do are books and materials that you check out, that you give people. One of the key things we do, you can see that we have, we have trended downwards for the last 10 years, even though, um, of course, books and materials, the costs of the things we do have gone up. We're now at an average of about 50 cents per resident per year. Next. This is what I'm looking at for the future. Depending on what happens with the governor's budget, um, I may be looking at something like $160,000. As I've pointed out in my staff report, that's mostly going to have to come from people because there's not a lot of other places to cut. We've already cut it. And the year after that, we're looking at even more. And this is a crisis. Next. Melanie, could you just, yes. for, while we're on this, in the fiscal impacts, could you just give a little bit of additional information on wh how you're arriving at the numbers there in the red, the shortfall? Like, it's in one fiscal year, it's almost doubling. And can yes. you explain that? Um, in revenues, that's because we're, I'm able to carry over somewhere around 160000 or so, and so that's why it looks so much worse, is because when I spend it all next year, then it won't be there. And does this also reflect the diminishing dollars from the state? I'm assuming it does. Yes, yes, it does. And I'm actually being a little bit positive in that I put a little bit of money in there from the state. Okay, thanks. Now I'm going to touch a little bit on the impacts we're going to see in the next couple of years. Next. We're going to see major reductions in open hours in 11-12. And in 
we're going to have to close libraries. We're going to be out of options, and we will have to close libraries. 12-13, next. Starting this fiscal year, we're going to uh, reduce and likely eliminate children's programming in our larger branches, Fort Bragg, Willits, Ukiah. Next. We're going to be eliminating borrowing or lending out of region. That means all we're going to lend is between Sonoma, Lake, and Mendocino. Next. We are going to need to renegotiate with the law library to recover uh, full costs. Um, we have been uh, providing them service, or if we can't work out in a, a cost agreement, we'll have to dissolve our MOU. And finally, it's okay. We will continue unscheduled closures of branches due to lack of staff. E even last week, we were that close to closing down Ukiah Main Branch because we didn't have the staff or volunteers to keep it open. Next. So here are some options for the future that I would like the board to consider. Number one. That I alternate staff and library hours beginning inland. Larger, busier branches will be closed more days and hours, and the smaller, less busy ones will keep about the same hours at least for this coming uh, fiscal year. Next. We can request money from the cities. Next. We can turn certain libraries over to the cities with their portion of the tax revenues and leave countywide efforts coordinated by county staff. Or we can look at the new Siskiyou model, which is based on the level of community support that can be garnered by each community level of volunteer and uh, have support based on that. We can restrict hours further in each library, not coordinate it, but just cut it. That would be probably moving many of the staff to part-time. Next. We can possibly contract with Sonoma County or NorthNet Library System for operations. And finally, we could look into privatizing the libraries. The county could seek private providers to operate our libraries. So what are our next steps? With the board's permission, I would like to explore options one through six or whatever options that you guys want me to pursue. Uh, I intend to meet with the public all over the county to discuss needed services. Uh, after I do that, um, I would like to work with Joan Fry Williams, who developed the Siskiyou model. She's not wedded to it, but she is an expert in it, um, to look at model services for coming up. And I hope to present a final recommendation and budget during the recommended budget hearings. Might go over to the final budget hearings. Next. So, Madam Chair, w do you want questions now or shall I go to my last slide? I believe Supervisor Brown has been waiting. And she has a question. Yes, um, thank you. I wanted to go back to the bookmobile. Um, I had thought it was all paid for, and you stated that they're still raising funds to cover it? There, we have it paid for out of the endowment fund. What the friends of the library want to do is reimburse the endowment fund as much as they can. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for asking. So I'm seeing no other questions right now, so why don't you proceed? Okay, next slide. The other option. Uh, the Library Advisory Board would like to present you with is a possible eight cent sales tax. Uh, it's projected to raise up about 1.3 million per year. Um, the Library Advisory Board would like you to put the initiative on the November 2011 uh, ballot and they are here to talk about that. So unless you have any questions of me right now, I'd like to invite them forward. I believe, did you have a question? I did just have one question about the logic of cutting the branches that are busier and serve more patrons and deliver more units of service, uh, presumably at a lower cost per unit of service. We're going to cut them more hours than other branches. Wouldn't it make sense to, if you're going to cut hours, cut them equally and everyone can adjust to the, to the new schedule? 
that is you know certainly something that we can uh, look into but at this point I'm just trying to spread what little staff I have around and so um, Yes, I think it would make more sense to leave our busier uh, libraries open more hours, but... Well, I'm, I'm not saying more, I'm saying equal. Or equal, yes. Um, I'd like to hope I can do that. I just don't know what the budget impact is going to be yet. They're already down to... The smaller branches only already have one staff. So... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so that really is the problem. I mean, there, there's only... You know, it's like with the museum. There's only so far you can cut before you have no library. And right. I think a good example is the CCL, which is down to one 32-hour person a week. And if you took that person down to, say, 20 hours a week, that person would no longer have a job because well, they couldn't afford to work 20 hours a week, especially coming from Fort Bragg every day. Well, actually, so, I'd probably... I'd probably put that person in Fort Bragg part-time and in Coast Community part-time. Yeah, but I, I guess, you know, there, there is a logic to what you're suggesting, and I, I just don't want that to be, to be missed. I mean, there is a reason why, you're, why you would cut the inland um, larger libraries more than you would the outlying libraries, because the outlying libraries really only have one staff person or fewer as it is now. That's correct. But it wouldn't just be inland, it would be all three. It would be Willis, Fort Bragg, and Ukiah, I believe. This next coming fiscal year hit would be Fort Bragg, Willits, and Ukiah. So it's the larger ones, not necessarily where they're located. Right. Yeah. Okay. Supervisor Pinches. Melanie, when do you expect to get any word from the state on what the state funding is going to be? I don't know. <laughs> I thought you had. Uh, we, we, uh, don't I seem, put we don't seem to get much uh, <laughs> information coming very fast from the I do know that the budget committee uh, did reduce um, funding, but kept the funding in um, the uh, now, joint now, budget. Now, think about what you just said. You said they reduced it, but they kept the funding. Well, they, the Governor Brown's budget totally eliminated yeah. funding to all libraries. Um, the combined Senate Assembly budget kept it in, some in. Some in. But at a reduced rate. Yeah, what's the... I mean. uh, it went from uh, 30000 Total to about fifteen thousand total. So thirty. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Th this is so statewide. So roughly 30 million, that affects 50 your million. department about two hundred thousand. Well, actually, I don't know yet. I, think I estimated about sixty thousand for next year, if the assembly budget. And again, I don't know. Okay, let's go to the rest of the presentation yeah. and have the library advisory board come forward because we're really tight on time and we need to move on to that. I'm going to start off. Uh, my name is Michael Schaefer. I live in Comshi. I'm the 5th District uh, representative. Uh, we have four of us here today who represent the uh, subcommittee on <coughs> revenue and how to deal with the problem that the Library Advisory Board, which is a uh, larger body, has set up. And uh, so we've been meeting uh, pretty much because the situation is, is not a surprise to us. We've, we've watched uh, the county's ability to help us out in times of need vanish. You know, we were rather shocked to see that the, uh, at the state level that the governor is proposing a total cessation of library support. Um, and we, we know that, that all five of you are library fans and supporters. Uh, we know that uh, from personal contact and we know that because every time a library branch has been thre threatened here before, and we bring people th to the Board of Supervisors chambers, the decision is always to keep those libraries open. And uh, we look at, at the financial realities and the pressures that, that you're facing with uh, your funds, and we think that the only way that, that we can achieve our goal, which is secure and independent funding for the libraries, is to augment uh, our funding sources. You know, at right now the, uh, the library is funded through the property tax. We get a certain uh, proportion of that. And if we uh, get a, a one-eighth cent sales tax, we'll be able to um, 
restore services, avoid these drastic cuts that uh, Melanie has been uh, out laying out for us, uh, and go a long way to, uh, to giving the, li the library a funding mechanism that will secure its future and mean that we won't have to uh, come back and, and beg for money. And it, after the 2013-14 year, when we no longer have to pay that outrageous amount for uh, you know, the uh, risk claim of 2004, we'll have that additional money. You know, so that that, that, that will, uh, again, give us future and as the, as the economy grows, the sales tax, as well as property taxes, will rise. So we'll have an income source that will uh, grow with the, uh, the growth of the county. Um, I think Melanie talked about the, the uh, losses that we've already had. Just in the last two years, we've dropped from uh, 13 FTE to, um, no, from 18 FTE to 13 FTE, a drop of five FTE over 25% of, of library staff, which is why we're in the situation with one person per uh, branch in, in the smaller libraries and one or to three, the, the most I think is in Ukiah. Um, at any rate, so the, you know, the, library look, the library advisory board has looked at various ways of, of doing it. We discovered the, uh, uh, the legislature passed several years ago a, uh, a bill that allows uh, boards of supervisors to put a special tax on the ballot. Uh, either a one-eighth cent tax or a one-quarter cent tax for supportive libraries. Uh, we think that, that it's appropriate to do this now in Mendocino County. We think that the uh, one-eighth rate is the appropriate amount, uh, not because we couldn't use more money, but because, you know, I think that we would be perceived as being greedy if we went out for, for more. And I think one-eighth of a cent, you know, strikes people as a, a, a pretty small amount. Uh, you know, there are lots of ways to do the math on that, but the, uh, uh, if, according to statistics, the, the average Mendocino family has an income of about $40,000, and I would think that less than half of, uh, of that is subject to sales tax. Rent, mortgage payments aren't subject to sales tax. Services aren't subject to sales tax. Food isn't subject to sales tax. So if, if you assume that even $20,000 of that uh, $40,000 was spent on sales tax items, uh, the impact of a one-eighth cent tax to that family would be $25. We have a, a lot of sales tax, obviously, that, that is passed on indirectly through you know, businesses having to pay sales taxes for their things. And, but we also have a lot of out-of-town uh, visitors coming in, buying things and paying sales tax and, and who are, are not county residents. Um, so we, we, uh, we think that it's the only way to uh, avoid what Melanie was outlined at, uh, is to adopt some kind of revenue enhancement. And we bring this to you in the hope that you will direct staff to prepare such an ordinance uh, to pre present to the voters in uh, November, and it, and when it's passed, then I think that we even have the, the ability, you know, for the second half of the fiscal year to to borrow against the anticipated revenues in the future, so we can avoid some of these things even happening in this upcoming fiscal year. And I'm going to turn it over next to uh, Benj. Good afternoon, supervisors. Uh, Benj Thomas, I am the appointed representative from the City Council to the Library Advisory Board, and I am, uh, I don't need to tell you what you already know. Um, you've had a, a, a dismal picture of our prospects. You've had a uh, description of, of how we might uh, address those problems. Uh, I would simply like to talk with you pretty briefly about uh, not so much the material things as the intangibles that the library brings to you. Um, let me start with one, and that is that, that in terms of volunteers, um, the library uh, has the equivalent of eight full-time employees serving as volunteers. 
Uh, if the libraries go down, that labor, that volunteer help goes somewhere. I hope it goes somewhere so rather than disappears. But that's a tremendous community resource, not only in terms of what they give to the library, but what they give, to, what they create within the community, which is that sense of, of, of volunteerism uh, on which we depend so heavily. Um, we're also talking about literacy. Uh, you have seen that the, the children's programs would disappear. The impact on that, of that on, on children's literacy would be palpable. I don't think you can dispute that. We have a very active, very excellent children's library program in this county, and it, it does need to be preserved for the benefit of the kids and their futures. Um, the library system also is a draw. People do, when they're visiting town, they visiting the county, they do come to our library. Uh, if you are a business looking to locate in the library, why would you come to a county that, that has a practically non-functioning library? It's, it's one of those things that is uh, an amenity, perhaps, but also probably a necessity. Um, but I think the underlying point goes back to uh, what it means to our community to have this library. It is a gathering place, it is a focal place, and it is something that binds us together in a time when we desperately need that kind of binding. We need that sense of community that the library, as perhaps as much as any institution that we have, um, provides. And therefore, we are coming to you. I am a passionate believer in libraries. I'm a passionate believer in their value to every member of the community. And all you need to do is look at the, the rate of use um, going up, even as we have shrunk ours, to know that it is a treasured resource. And I appreciate your support and your willingness to help us achieve a stable, well-funded library. Thank you. Mark Comer, third, uh, third district representative. Uh, I'd just like to add briefly that uh, Supervisor Smith, Madam Chair, you have said in the past that um, you would like it if, if uh, we'd stop complaining and we'd start bringing some options to the board. And so we are a citizens group. We're volunteers. We care about the library and we care about the county. And we're offering a solution to a grave problem. So this is an opportunity here for us to do something together for the benefit of the community. Now you may think, uh, what happens if this measure doesn't pass? It does take two-thirds vote. We, we're not naive. Uh, we think it's going to pass. We think there's the grassroots. But if it does not pass, uh, we would be willing to examine uh, the library director's options for the future without this funding and do what needs to be done. However. Uh, among us, the Library Advisory Board, if, if we fail this year, we're going to learn our lessons and we're going to be back to try this again. We're not going to give up. I don't think, Mark, I ever said that you should stop complaining. I don't think those were my words. <laughs> I've met with the Library Advisory Board on a number of occasions and I've always supported the work you're doing. I think you're all very dedicated. I was just saying I think you need to be smart and be diverse in your advocacy strategies. This is it. Okay. All Anyone right. else from uh, the team? Good afternoon. Valerie Fry, 4th District Representative. Um, I'd just like to mention that we have great friends of the library groups, but I believe all our groups are now spending more than we're taking in every year. And. Uh, one thing we did last year when the no book budget and no subscription budget was put it out to the community, adopt a magazine. Tremendous response in several libraries. So I think we have support. I think if people see exactly where their money's going, what they're getting for it, they're willing to do it. They're willing to vote for it. So thank you. Thank you. So Melanie, is that does that com conclude your presentation? Because I'll need to go to public comment. Yes, Madam Chair. Good. Thank you. Okay, so we'll, I'll do that now. I'm going to go to public comment. Anyone else from the audience that wish to address this topic with the board, please come forward. 
Seeing none, we will come back to the board, and the board may have questions of all of you. Supervisor Pinches was first, then Supervisor Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I'd like to thank the advisory board for not only your all of your work you do throughout the year and throughout all the years, but your special work on taking the initiative. I think this putting this uh, sales tax measure on the ballot is a real opportunity where we can control our own destiny here in this county. We always complain about what government's doing, federal government, state government, or this and that, but this is a real chance for the people in Mendocino County can step up and take a couple of cents out of their pocket because in actuality when you talk about a sales tax measure most of the money that will be derived from this actually comes from probably out of, out of area people that are supporting our library but it's a real chance for for Mendocino County to control their destiny in an area of the library system which is is proven to be year in and year out good years and bad years all sorts of economy is really important to the people of Mendocino County Sometimes people ask me, you know, well, you know, maybe we should cut some service in libraries. So, you know, library really isn't a what you would call a core service or a mandatory function. But it's something that everybody needs and enjoys. Some people enjoy the library. Other people simply need to go to the library for different things. But it's, uh, as Ben said, you know, it's a, a lot of people out of the area stop and go to the libraries. But this is besides this being you know and it's there's going to be the downside of well well should i vote for a you know increase in my sales tax you know and all those arguments there but this is a real and i'd like to see this being sold as a real opportunity to control and, and and direct the county in the right direction you know i said many times here i'm not here to tear down the county i'm here to build it up and this is when we can take this opportunity and I would hope that every citizen in Mendocino County would vote for this initiative to cure number one, give the library some money, but beyond that, give it a secure funding source so the library can expand and plan in, in the future. That's, that's just as important to me as keeping the library open tomorrow morning, is let, let's, let's, take, let's start putting this county on a destiny to where it's going to be for a brighter future instead of one that's just going to be dismal and last sorts loss of services but uh, an eighth of a percent sales tax increase i mean you know if you buy something for uh it's under a dollar i mean it's not even going to be negligible it's not even going to ch change what you pay i mean really it's it's really not much of anything and and for something that's you know we have a the coastal library services and, and in Round Valley and in, in Willits here in Ukiah, it's uh, kind of phenomenal of what we have in this county right now. But I, I, I wouldn't look at this and I wouldn't bill it this as a tax increase. I think this is a vote of, this, of a direction for Mendocino County's future. So I wholeheartedly support it. I've told members of the board that uh, they can use my name uh, probably to see my name in support of a tax increase maybe the first time in history in Mendocino <laughs> County. But anyways, this is something I'm I'm not just behind. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that every person in this county votes for it. I'm not interested in two-thirds of the vote. I want everybody to vote for it. <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor Brown. Thank you, Chair Smith. And, and while I love the libraries as well, um, I did meet um, with my representative and um, an individual that was with her. And I had a couple of questions, and I'm sure the individual that's here today um, knows what I'm going to be asking. But it's my understanding it's going to cost about $56,000 estimated um, for the election. Or is that 46? I understand it's 59000 59000 Okay. And um, I hate to, I don't want to put any bad karma on it. <laughs> But I also asked, and, and Mark, you were the individual um, that was with my appointee, how are we going to pay that if the major loses? I mean, it, the, you know, who's going to pay? Um, well, it's a risk I think we're all going to have to take. Okay. Um, but uh, is there a plan if it loses? Uh, Friends of the library um, are going to reimburse the county? I have, um, I have I no mean, knowledge. I, huh? I have no knowledge of that. 
Okay, because myself, we're in such a situation, um, and, and we're counting um, pennies, nickels, and dimes. Uh, the cost of putting the election on, um, and, and especially as we go into next year, still not knowing what the state of California is going to do. Um, I've got to look at every penny and cost versus benefit. Um, I'm responsible um, for, you know, trying to keep our ship right up um, without hitting a tsunami. And so, anyway, um, I, I just have to have some answers um, you to the questions I've asked. The election would cost 59000 That would be shared by any other parties that come that are on the ballot, so if that's college districts or whoever else, if, if the fire departments, the fire chiefs put something on the ballot, uh, that 59,000 would be shared by others. So if we're the only, if the library advisor, if our measure is the only measure, then yes, it would be on the libraries. Um, I'm assuming we're gonna pass. I think it's, it's not an if, I'm, I'm looking at so, when we pass. So your plan would be? To reimburse. To reimburse the county of Mendocino um, as those revenues start coming in. That, that's me. Okay. That's, that's, not a vote, that's, not well, a vote, that's not a vote of our board. <laughs> that's me. I, I, you know, I. I could get back to you. We're having a meeting tomorrow and we can okay. uh, talk about what you're asking and then I could come back to you and tell you what we've decided. Um, but I do want, you know, some type of a plan and a so solid um, commitment. Um, I'd like to just state that it is 225. We have another workshop in another, uh, we have a, a workshop in another part of the building at 230. We need to take a brief break. So I'm thinking I wanted to poll my colleagues that this is going to need to, I think, be a longer discussion. I think we need to get this back and have more discussion on it because it's a very important issue and it can't be rushed and we don't have time to really delve into it this afternoon. Madam Chair. Supervisor Pinches. Well, I'd like to, I'm forgetting things, making decisions and whatnot. If there's an issue, if, I'd like to get the motion to move this forward right now. And as far as the issue who will pay for it, I'll make a personal commitment that if it fails, I'll work for this county for one year. You can take my salary and fund it, fund this cost. So make sure that puts on the record. So Supervisor Brown. <laughs> I hope that alleviates the question. Take a vote, <laughs> take a vote. <laughs> Supervisor Brown, did you have another comment? Um, County Council, um, in between now and the workshop, I, I want um, a contract drawn up. <laughs> Do I have to sign? <laughs> you better sign in blood. <laughs> if it need be, I'll sign whatever you want. Here. I think I'm good for it. Unless I die, you'll all be screwed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is the, is the board wanting to make a decision now? What, what is the pleasure of the board? Supervisor McCowan. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, thank I'm kind of getting the sense that the board does want to go ahead and make a decision now, but, you know, I do want to make the point that uh, we did try a sales tax measure uh, not too long ago, and although it was not a special tax, uh, it was a general tax. The board did attempt to make a commitment as to how we would spend the money, and it, it included the library. It included uh, programs for disabled seniors and children. It included public safety. Uh, there might have been one or two other uh, subject categories in there. And so now, you know, we're looking at here's how we take care of the library, but then uh, do we have a thought that we would do anything for these other groups that are in equally dire straits? And so my only thought is that maybe before just rushing ahead and saying, yes, we're putting this on the ballot, as, uh, you know, Chair Smith said, maybe it should be part of a bigger discussion. And I'm, I'm not saying uh, in any way that I don't support moving forward with this, but in fairness to uh, other budgetary needs in the county, 
I think we should uh, consider whether it should be part of a larger discussion. Supervisor Is, Hamburg. Yeah, Madam Chair, I did bring this up with, um, uh, with Michael Schaefer, who's the, the fifth district rep. And, you know, I made kind of the same pitch that Supervisor McGowan just made. And I, I felt like uh, he and his colleagues on the advisory board made some pretty good arguments for why they are ready, you know, they've done the research, they're ready to move forward. Um, the library is kind of kind of special. I mean, I would not feel as confident betting Johnny's salary if we added, you know, <laughs> even if we added the sheriff to it. I don't think it's as solid. I mean, I don't think there's anything more solid to get two thirds than, you know, we're talking about 12 cents on $100. And, you know, I mean, I'm swept away with the optimism. I think we can, we can pass this thing. And, and I know your argument, John, and that was the first thing that struck me is, you know, let's bunch this in. Let's take something that's really popular and add it in with something that's not as popular. Like, you know, anything. <laughs> anything. That, that's actually not what I was saying. Well, <laughs> and that wasn't my offer either. <laughs> well, I know. But anyway, um, I, you know, I would like to see us move this along. And I, I think also the Library Advisory Board would like to see this moved along. And I would like to uh, try to do that by offering the recommended motion. Second. Comment to the motion? Absolutely, Supervisor Brown. Thank you, Chair Smith. Um, I, I, I do feel it's, it needs a larger discussion. Um, again, a plan. Um, that's called long range planning. Um, and this county hasn't done a lot of that. Um, earlier, we talked about another county service that uh, this board is responsible for and um, the lack of communication, the lack of seeing what the plan is. Um, and I just think, and we're going through difficult times, we need a good long range plan um, for, for everything this board is responsible for. Uh, well, um, I probably, I, I, I would say I'm gonna uh, vote to support it, but I think we do need more conversation about this. And um, I may vote no today, but, um, if there is a, the opportunity, I may get outvoted. Um, I, you know, I would like to see it go on the ballot. Um, but I do think we need a plan. We need it in writing. Um, you know, what is the long range? Um, I, I just, I, I need that. Yes, go ahead. I just wanted to respond to a, a couple specific things, especially to Supervisor McCowan's argument. Uh, as I understand the law, you cannot put a general tax increase on the ballot until 2012. So the, the only- I'm not talking about a general tax increase. Okay, all right. So I, mean, is, I just then let the, the public be clear that the only taxes that can go on the ballot this November are special taxes that take a two-thirds vote. And I think that to uh, Supervisor Brown's uh, point, what we are looking for here today is really direction to county council to bring you back an ordinance that takes two readings and you'll have ample opportunity in the, that process of her bringing back an ordinance to you uh, and the two readings of it to have this, you know, more discussion and to incorporate the other uh, parts that you think may be missing at this point. But I think that what we're looking for is, is direction to county council to prepare that ordinance and agendize it for discussion by the board. That's, I think that's very clear. That was my understanding. So it doesn't mean anything is a, is a final decision today by any means. Supervisor uh, Pinches and Supervisor Brown. Supervisor Brown, I completely concur with you, but I th really believe this is a first step in long-term long planning for the library. You know, the library is a special district, so you can only, you, I mean, it gets its t property tax increment no matter what happens with the county general fund. So it is kind of set aside, but I think, you know, the first step in long-term planning is we have to maintain, you know, the status quo. We have to maintain our buildings and, and what we have right now. 
Uh, I don't think, I think we're kind of at a low point and the projections up there s showing that if we don't do something on the revenue side, that we got big problems. When, and we may have bigger problems with the state than we actually even know today. So I think this is the first step in long range planning. And I, I, I'm just totally committed to this and I'd like to see it move forward today because if we can move forward today with the unanimous vote, that's going to give us the first step in what I think will be a unanimous vote of the people of Mendocino County for this. Supervisor Brown. Um, Chair Smith, I through you, I'd like to ask County Council a question. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, County Council, would you need um, more direction in beginning this? Like, is it a, um, a sales tax measure that may sunset? Um, I mean, are you, do you feel confident the time that you're gonna put into it, um, you have enough information to go forward? Yeah, I, I, I have no problem with bringing forth a, a, an ordinance. Uh, the sunset provision would be certainly up to the board and that could be left blank at the time I bring it for the first reading and you can insert that. Um, but other than that, it's a pretty standard ordinance. It would have to be reviewed by the Board of Equalization before you know, we move it on the road to putting it on the ballot, but, but, um, and, so and then what would be, what would be the, I guess, I'm concerned too about the process. It, would there be signatures that had to be gathered? No, 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 no. It would just be the a, board this of board supervisors adopts it. would put it on the ballot. So, but I you have to adopt the ordinance prior to doing that. And again, through the chair, um, Ms. Renichek is here. Um, what's our drop dead date? <laughs> Putting it on the ballot, I'd have yeah. to go back and double check, but it's this August. Okay. It's it's the so we have some time. Okay. You have some time to do that. Yes. Okay. And there's no drop dead date for Supervisor Pinches. <laughs> well, I hope not, since he's going to pay for it. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Smith. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> okay. So, Supervisor McCown. Well, given that. Uh, this is the first step in a long process. Would there be any objection by the makers of the motion in the second? If we do have that larger discussion that's been uh, referenced by three of us when this item comes back so that we could have a discussion, is this uh, the only special tax that we would like to consider putting on the ballot? Is there another special tax for other departments that we would like to take a look at or not? But I, I think we should have that discussion because there's only so many slices of the pie that we're going to be able to take. And yet we've got an acute need across the board for additional revenue to support ongoing services. So uh, this is a great solution for the library. It may, uh, we should be aware, it may limit our choices for solutions for other departments. I think we should have that discussion up front. Well, additionally, Supervisor McCowan, the, the, the library doesn't currently draw any general fund dollars. So in terms of enhanced revenue for the library, it doesn't do anything to address our fiscal issues that I think Supervisor, Supervisor Brown is talking about. Mm -hmm. um, that's, just, that's just a fact. That isn't, that isn't anything uh, pro or con about the situation. It just is a fact. It's not dealing with some of the economic things that we know are right front and center and perhaps some of us think should have been dealt with quite some time ago. So I would say an answer to that question, but we could go to council, is that um, nothing else is actionable today except what is right in front of us, and nothing that we decide on this today precludes any other discussion on taxation coming forward at any point in time. So that's just how I would address that, and council's nodding that she, that she agrees with that. So um, can we wrap this up? We are now 10 minutes past where we should be because we need a five minute break to reconvene in conference room C. So do we have any final um, comments? I, we do have a motion by Supervisor Pinches and a second by Supervisor Hamburg. Supervisor mm -hmm. Brown. Okay, um, I, I do realize what you're talking about with the general fund, but again, it's, it's my theme. Um, I guess I've been carrying out through, throughout the last month or two months We've got to know, we got to have plans. We have to know what those plans are before we move forward, have some type of written documentation. Um, and I do agree with Supervisor um, McCowan. Um, 
Uh, we need to have a larger conversation. Right. And I don't think any action here today precludes that. And that's what I got the affirmative from Council. Supervisor McCallum. Uh, correct. That's just what I was going to say. I think we will still have the opportunity to have that larger conversation. Okay. So uh, I am going to vote for the motion on the floor. Okay. So am I. Uh, I believe I misspoke before the motion was by Supervisor Hamburg with the second by Supervisor Pinches. All right, so um, is the clerk clear? It's the stated motion in the agenda, so we'll vote by the buttons. Motion passes unanimously. Good. Thank you. So we will now take a five minute break and reconvene in conference room C at uh, 243. Thank you. Huh? I got